Uh, so if you don't know me, my name is James Brightman. Um, I've been writing about the industry for almost two decades. Um, recently started leading some editorial uh, at Casual Connect, which is now, as Lee was talking about, Game Daily Connect. And uh, you know, who better to kind of help us kick off this rebranding than someone like Jack Tretton, who has been in you know, the industry for nearly 30 years, uh, almost 20 at PlayStation, and then before that on the corporate side. So, you know, ton of expertise, knows the industry inside and out, and so I thought this was a great opportunity to really just get things started and kind of broaden out. Um, so Jack, let's, let's start with that in terms of your experience. Um, you know, you learned so much about the way this industry works from all your time at PlayStation and the corporate side before that. Um, what are some of the, the key takeaways and as you've watched this industry evolve that, um, you know, that you would like to pass on to the audience? Well, I, I think I started out like probably most of the people in this room and most of the people that get in the industry do, just being a gamer and being a fan of gaming. And when presented with an opportunity to get in the industry, I was like, wow, there might be a way, at least for a little while, to make a mo some money doing what I love. Uh, and I never dreamed, that was back in 1986, that it would be my entire career. Um, and I think it's grown from something that was perceived as a fad or a toy, as something that was strictly for males uh, up to age 17, that it is mainstream entertainment. It's bigger than box office and um, the music industry combined. And it is an industry to be reckoned with. And I'm just pleased to see that it's finally getting recognized for the art form that it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, what are some of the biggest surprises during this time as you've watched the industry evolve that you would point to? Well, I, I think one of the things um, that can happen to everybody that definitely happened to me is you get caught up in what you're doing. So my world really for the, the better part of 20 plus years was the console industry. So the world revolved around the console industry and not only the console industry, but one console. And I've really enjoyed over the last five years uh, appreciating the depth uh, of, of gaming and the fact that uh, you know there are people involved in every different format and every different genre and there's new stuff coming all the time so uh, it is just this blank canvas that is a long way from being full and there's endless potential in it if uh, it's it's just it's 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 just a matter of people's imagination in terms of where it can go right and we won't dwell on PlayStation for too long but just a couple more questions there so um, you know, you saw some amazing things at PlayStation. What are some of your fondest memories from those days? Well, the, the platform launches are, you know, probably the coolest thing I've ever done and was there for the first platform launch of PlayStation 1 back in 95. And the excitement around that, you know, you work uh, pretty tirelessly for a couple of years leading up to it, not really sure how it's going to be received, but, you know, you get there on launch day and you see the enthusiasm from the gamers and you really feed off of that. So this will be the first platform launch that I haven't physically been involved in since then. Um, um, that's the bad news. The good news is, um, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a dog in the fight. I can uh, really just watch what's happening and and get excited about all the different platforms as a developer and as a gamer. So I'm excited about that. Right, as you said, you don't have a dog in the fight. The last time we all saw you, like in the most public way, was on stage at E3 more than five years ago, launching the, the PS4 and kind of taking advantage of a little bit of a stumble out of the gate from Microsoft. And so let's just talk about that for a minute because there's a, there's a perception that you know the, the console wars that people take that seriously, kind of like you know Yankees, Red Sox, the, the people inside the organizations like hate each other or something. But from what I understand, you guys are, you know, or even back then, you, you were pretty close and that the console wars are a little bit kind of a, of a fabrication. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I did have a big dog in the fight at that point. And, right. and you know, you, you play to win and you fight for the team that you're, you're playing for. But it really is a business and it is a war in the sense that um, the success of uh, another company might come at your ability to accomplish your goals. But in the end, we're all citizens of the industry. And I've said many, many times, rising tide lifts all boats. So um, while, you know, you don't want competition, competition is what grows the industry and makes everybody better better. And yeah, I think outside of the corporate uh, structure, everybody in the industry is pretty friendly. And I've probably spent, you know, a lot more time with Microsoft over the last five years than I have, you know, folks I used to work with at Sony. And I remember the first few times I walked in the building and people would kind of shake their heads and smile a little bit and like, man, you killed us at that E3. And uh, I was like, oh, sorry about that, but I love you guys. And, uh, you know, it, we, we were all friends.
friends, but it's, it's, uh, it's different when you walk in the building of a, a company you used to compete with, and now you know, you're looking for their support and you want to be involved in their platform. But uh, I think the people at Microsoft in particular are great, and I mean, Nintendo's been around forever, so you always have a relationship with them. And, and the great thing about being chairman of the Entertainment Software Association was that you know, we put the industry first and individual companies second. And you know, I took my Sony hat off on every time uh, I was involved with the ESA. So it, it went beyond corporate borders you know, really from day one. Right, so let's talk about your, your new company, Interactive Gaming Ventures, and kind of what attracted you to kind of the indie scene and wanting to, to help fund more indies coming away from the kind of the corporate executive side? Well, the, the world I grew up in uh, was, was like I think the movie industry was for an extended period of time and maybe to a degree in that there were major studios that had all the dollars and all the development budgets. There were major retailers that controlled whether or not your game ever got on the shelf. Um, and everybody was beholding to them and it really limited um, you know, the creativity and the business opportunities. And with the advent of the digital age and, and indie developers, um, you saw the number of AAA publishers decline. You saw a narrowing of the focus among the AAA publishers going on less and less big budget games that you know they could really sell a lot of episodic content on. And then with uh, the ability to sell digitally direct to the consumer from the stores, really anybody could be a publisher without having to be beholding to a major retailer or to a major studio. And I think that is the biggest difference uh, to happen to the industry since I've been involved in it. Um, and there is really just an, an endless amount of opportunity for uh, a creative developer. And I was really attracted to that because there's this huge pool of talent uh, that has an incredible ability, but in a lot of instances, um, they haven't had a lot of experience in bringing a product to market and all the pitfalls that go along with raising money uh, and making a game successful. And, and I thought I could help in that area. And I've, that's really what I've been focused on the last five years. And I'm enjoying every minute of it. Right, so let's talk about that because you know those are big hurdles. Getting money, getting you know, and and getting discovered on digital storefronts, discoverability is an ongoing issue. So, um, you know, how would you kind of look at those two things plus any other hurdles that you might see for you know the independent uh, development scene out there? Yeah, I, I experienced a lot of things that I think any developer goes through. First, we started with a, a small fund um, that was a special purpose vehicle uh, raised with a bunch of investors focused on one studio. Uh, and then we decided to go out and raise a much larger fund. Um, and that brought in uh, agents and it brought in investment banking. And I realized through that experience is about a year or so that I was going to spend more of my time uh, raising money with investors than I was with developers, and that's much less attractive to me. So I think the first key and the thing I learned, and I think everybody in the development community learns, is it's a matter of finding the money and finding the money from the right people and people that are going to be aligned with the same goals that you have. Uh, and then I think the other big key uh, is, you know, you've got a development strategy, you've raised your money, uh, but are you thinking about your go-to-market strategy and what happens after launch the entire time? Or is it something that because you've been heads down trying to get the game finished, it's kind of like ship and duck and what do we do now? The game's on the market. How do we maximize its sales? So those are the areas where I think are big pain points. And those are the areas where I try to lend assistance to any developers we work with. Right. Do you think developers maybe should engage in some business courses or things? Because there are a lot of developers who are very creative but are not business savvy, which is why obviously they want to work with a company like yours. But I think everybody has a unique set of skills and everybody, unless they're an egomaniac, has their weaknesses. And, and the key is to surround yourself with people that can uh, help you with your weaknesses and uh, you really bring out your strengths. So I think it's just finding out uh, what you like and what you're good at and try to align yourself with people that can help you uh, in, in areas where you're deficient and do it without giving away the store. Because if you give away points to everybody, you realize the game ships and you don't own any of it. Um, and so you got a lot of help and the game was a success, but you're broke. So, you know, you got to really make sure that, uh, that you get value for your, for your relationships. So when you're looking to partner up with developers, I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience will kind of want to know, like, what, what is it that you're looking for? How do you identify the talent that you want to work with? 
Well, I think there's a, a lot of different ways uh, of doing it. I mean, the perfect world um, is to have some degree of a relationship going in and some degree of familiarity. Whenever Sony would acquire a studio, we typically do an external development project, give them an opportunity to understand the culture, give us an opportunity to understand how they work. That's you know kind of difficult to do in the indie space, but we're looking for long-term relationships. We're not looking for one and done. We're looking to get involved with the developer and ultimately say, okay, if this works out, you never have to worry about raising money for your next game. Um, we're looking for people that are in growth stage. Um, unfortunately, I think it's difficult to work with teams that are just forming and putting out their first game. But it's also probably not a target developer to get with somebody that's been doing it for a long, long time and, and already has uh, an established culture. We're looking to get um, that team that's on their second or third game, has had commercial success, but is looking to build from there. Um, and then we want everybody to be aligned. I mean, there's a lot of investors that are going to make money all along the way. There's a lot of teams that want to make sure that uh, they're pulling decent money out of the development budget while the game is being built. We want everybody that's aligned completely that um, the development process and the investment stage is the pain point. The success of the game is where everybody reaps the rewards and we all win together or we all lose together. Uh, there's no way that the investors come out ahead and the developers come out broke or conversely that the developers were fat and happy and started three projects over two years and all our money's gone and we got nothing to show for it. So you've got to be aligned. And there's a million different ways to do it. It's just finding the investor and the team that, that it's right for everybody. All right, so we talked a bit about the pain points. Um, you know, when you look at maybe some of the developers that are starting out, um, what mistakes have you identified that if you could caution the, you know, kind of up and coming developers against, you know, what to look out for? Um, just uh, who you take money from and how you take money. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, you talk about young teams and they, they probably raise money within their family. And, um, you know, when it comes time for a milestone payment, they're like, yeah, we're running a little bit behind, but we need more money. And you're like, yeah, well, that's not going to work. The contract says this payment is based on that milestone. They're like, well, my mom was always pretty forgiving about it. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm sure she was, and I'm sure she loves you dearly, but unfortunately our investors are looking for a return, uh, and, it, and it doesn't work that way. Conversely, um, you've got uh, you know, somebody who desperately needs money, and they take a deal, uh, and they realize there's management fees being stripped out, um, and they said that you have the amount of time uh, to work with, but they're trying to get you to flip your studio, uh, and they're squeezing the money out of you because they want a quick return, and you realize that they weren't in it for the long haul and you took money from a partner that uh, probably was not the best choice. So, you know, that's, that's the biggest pain point uh, is being aligned day one. And if you're not aligned going in, you're definitely not going to be aligned coming out. Right. Um, so let's talk a bit about some of the trends in the industry right now. Obviously, cloud gaming is something that is kind of a big buzzword. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, we just saw in the last couple of weeks, Microsoft and Sony announcing this partnership where they're going to actually leverage the, the cloud platform from you know, Microsoft Azure. And so that was fascinating to me. And of course, seeing how Google is pivoting and moving and they're going to be announcing more soon. But you know, as someone who was a key part of that, that sort of platform war and, and, and seeing the beginnings of cloud gaming with PlayStation Now when you were still there, what is your overall take on, on where you think cloud gaming is, is headed and, and how disruptive it will actually be? Well, I think from a technology standpoint, it's very exciting to think that you could stream a game without latency direct to consumer. Um, and I think those technological hurdles will uh, get cleared, uh, if not you know, have already been cleared to the point where it can be a, a viable format. The, the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to understanding is the business model, because I think uh, any type of streaming service or any type of a, a catalog subscription download is great for games that have kind of uh, run their uh, life cycle and are, are part of a selection of games that you can play, um, you know, when you have some spare time. But uh, if you've put your heart and soul and development dollars into building a game that you want to take to market and you have opportunities on every platform to monetize that for whatever price you're selling it at. 
how does that work as you know part of a cloud gaming service? Uh, what are you going to pay the developer to have the right to their game? Because if I can just sign up for X dollars a month and play that game to my heart's content by streaming it, why would I buy it on another platform? So um, as, as a developer and investor, I've got to see a business model that says this is as profitable and not a threat uh, to putting my game out on console or PC um, to bring it over to, uh, to a cloud streaming service. So to me, that establishment of that being a viable marketplace uh, for day one releases is when um, cloud gaming becomes, you know, relevant on a level of, of the console and the PC. Right. Yeah. There, there are two obviously main things that the you know cloud gaming has to prove itself to developers, as you're saying, from a business standpoint, and how you know the revenue shares will work out, and then also to you know the the, the kind of customer standpoint and, and making sure there's a value proposition that's actually worthwhile for them. Um, how do you think this will shake out? Because people keep on saying, oh, well, you know, this will re replace consoles. But, you know, some of the analysts that I chat with actually say that, you know, the physical dedicated hardware is not going to be going anywhere for quite some time. Well, the one thing that you can always count on with the launch of any new generation is that people predict it's the last generation <laughs> of console. Um, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, so uh, I don't think it's going to happen in this generation. And I think ultimately, um, you know the machines can go away, and you can stream con direct to consumer content directly to consumers, and it all works out great. But at the end of the day, um, you know most people aren't doing this as a hobby; they're doing it as a way to make a living. And I think all gamers would love everything free, but at the end of the day, you know you get what you pay for. And uh, ultimately, to get great games, people need money, and uh, uh, you know, to be able to continue to make great games, they need to sell those games and get a return on their investment. And so uh, if there's a business model that, that makes sense and the experience is great for consumers, then you know, great, we'll move on. But um, you know, I think it, people gravitate towards the best entertainment experience and the gra greatest value for their dollars. And um, there's a number of different ways to do it. And you see most uh, core gamers today play on multiple platforms. So uh, I don't think there's, uh, there's ever a time when there's only one solution for gaming. I think there's going to be choices in perpetuity. And there's more now than there ever have been. And I think that's going to continue to grow. Right. Um, so you know, when we look at the industry and the types of games that are being made, obviously Fortnite took everyone by storm. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of developers out there who are thinking, oh, I need to create the next Fortnite and that's how I'm going to be successful. Um, you know, do you factor that into the sorts of things that you're looking at at IGV when you're you know, evaluating the, the content or the developers that are out there that might want to actually get help from, from your business? Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to be aware of trends and, you know, Halo is successful. Everybody wants to make the next Halo. Everybody wants to make the next Fortnite. Um, the best thing is to make the first Fortnite. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think you don't want to be the 15th Fortnite. And um, I think you realize the genre is hot. And if you have a spin on that genre and you can migrate uh, gamers over uh, from, from a popular game like Fortnite, that's a winning formula. Um, but I don't think you want to react to trends. I think you want to try to be there uh, in concert with them or ideally set them. And, um, you know, the, the thing is to, to do what you're passionate about. I mean, it, there's no way to look at it as a math formula and go, this is what makes money, this is what we need to do. You need to do what you're passionate about. And, you know, um, following trends is, um, is, is really chasing money. It's not chasing uh, innovation. And I think innovation is what has always driven this industry. And that's what will continue to drive it. Right. Um, so when you look at the AAA market, which obviously you were heavily involved with um, at, during your PlayStation days, um, you know, there's an ongoing discussion about, uh, you know, work-life balance, um, quality of life, uh, developers who are crunching. There are probably some developers in this audience here that, that think they need to kill themselves with work for, you know, 100-hour work weeks. Um, I guess, you know, uh, do you think that the industry needs to kind of change its ways to, to make things more sustainable, especially on the AAA side, which you were you know, heavily involved with? Um, I, I think, again, it comes down to culture. If the culture is, um, you know, you're forced to do it because if you dared go home at a reasonable hour, you know, you'd be shunned by the rest of the group and the company, then you're probably working for the wrong company. Uh, but I think especially in the indie space and for, for people that are real passionate about gaming, um, they're putting in the hours 
because they're passionate about it and it's their favorite thing to do. And if that's what drives them, I think that's fine. But if they're in a, a culture of pressure um, where uh, they're just they're forced to do more than their fair share relative to the expectations, they're probably working at the wrong place. And um, you know, I think a work-life balance is important, but I don't think it's that big of a problem in gaming in terms of um, forced uh, work. It's it's more that. Um, people in the industry are so consumed by it that that's all they think about 24-7. And I know, you know, I felt guilty that there's something going on in the world 24 hours a day and you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, I'm not going to pick up my phone. And then you say, well, I'm just going to look at it for a second. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're working 24 hours a day. I, I think that happens. But, um, you know, everybody tries to find a way to listen to their body and, you know, shut it down when they need to. And as long as they do that. But, you know, I, I think the people that are really passionate about the in the industry are, are comfortable with it. All right, I think we have time for one more, and then we'll uh, open it up to some audience questions. Um, so I guess, you know, just looking at what's ahead, obviously you're, you're working with indies now, but do you have any ambitions to kind of get involved with a big games firm again, or are those days behind you? Well, I mean, you know, the glass is, or the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. There are times I miss the big teams, and I miss the big budgets, and, um, uh, the big show. I've, I've done that for a long time. I mean, you never say never, but it would have to be something that I was absolutely passionate about with a team that I was absolutely passionate about and to leave something that I'm completely passionate about. So I can't envision it, but um, the thing I learned in this industry is that, you know, it takes turns um, pretty quickly, and so you never say never. But you know, I think the indie space and, and being independent myself is, is where I'm most comfortable at this stage of my career. All right, so um, if anyone has questions, I'm not sure if there's a mic out there. Um. Uh, visual media like movies, cinema, and audio and music as well, they've all moved from hardware, you know, sort of like your DVD collection, right, your albums through things like Spotify uh, and Netflix. So obviously that's a, sort of the trajectory we've seen with gaming. But how do you think that would fit with, I suppose, what is quite a niche area of gaming? Well, not niche, but a large part of it with the people that like to build their own hardware, people like to get their 1080, you know, GTX, uh, you know, get overclock it, set, you know, screen that every last frame. That part of the market seems like it's not necessarily uh, as quick to, or as likely to move in that direction. How do you think the industry can react to that and sort of deliver a streaming service that suits their needs? Well, one of the trends I think we see, it was everybody was going for the biggest uh, graphic uh, depth of gameplay experience. And so you had to have the most powerful PC or the most powerful console out there. And I think now cross-play and portability is something that's really important to people. And ultimately, it's about the gaming experience. So people are trying to find a medium that will allow you to get as many gamers involved across as many platforms as possible. So I think in many instances, um, social games that you will see um, kind of the technology bar coming down. Uh, but I also think that there's somebody that always wants to push the technological barriers and have an experience that's unlike you've ever seen before. So I think there's going to be a real variety across the board, and, and we're seeing that now. I just think it's really difficult to be everything to everybody. You can't be Fortnite and be this you know, high-end dedicated console game at the same time. You've got to choose a path. Um, and I think it's difficult as a studio to try to have a, a foot in every one of those places. I mean, we've got one mobile game in, in development, and it's a real diversion from what we do. And, and I'm learning a lot, and that's part of the motivation for it. But it's a completely different world from the PC and console space. So I just think it's, you know, find your expertise, find your passion, stick to that. Um, and there's more choice than there's ever been before. So you said that uh, you should always be careful with whom to partner with. Do you have an indicator for me as developer that tells me, run? That, that warns you this is somebody you shouldn't partner with. Yeah, I, I think um, it's, a, a, it's a relatively small industry in that if you don't know somebody, you can find people who do know them. Um, so ask around and do your homework a little bit. Um, if, it's the, if, if they've never invested in game development before, do you want to be uh, the person's foray, first foray into this industry? And I think anybody who's spent any time in this industry knows that it's unlike anything else in the world. And I don't really 
uh, welcome trying to uh, explain the industry uh, to a banker that doesn't know anything about the industry. And I did that fairly extensively when we were trying to raise money. And um, I just don't have the time to educate somebody on the business. So if they're giving you the money, uh, you need to understand what their expectations are, and more importantly, you need to convey to them um, what is going to transpire uh, over the next 18 to 24 months of, of development. So communication is really key, and honesty is very key, and you just have to hope that you know, you're being 100% honest and you're getting 100% honesty in return. But, you know, if you've had any success in business, you typically have a pretty good spidey sense and you start to re realize, you know, whether you're getting sincerity back or whether you're getting lip service. And, you know, that's the key. And that's the key to uh, using outside developers or anything that you do um, that spends your development budget over the course of, of the development of the game. What is, say, the last five years, your favorite game? Uh, what is it about it that you love so much? Um, Ark Survival Evolved uh, was a game I got back involved with back in 2015. Um, you know, open world survival uh, on a relatively small development budget um, that absolutely blew up, got criticized a lot along the way, spending too much time in early access, but they constantly had updates. And they've broken down so many barriers, and I was really proud um, to just dispel the myth that there's things that an indie game can't do, and there's nothing that an indie game can't do. And that game ended up going out in physical form all over the world. Um, and even though the development team had incredible success, one of the proudest moments for them was to walk into their local Walmart store and see it behind the glass for, for display. Because um, you know we, we all love having commercial success and having gamers enjoy our product. But to see your product on the shelf right beside Call of Duty and the rest of that stuff and having commercial success was, was a big deal for them. And, um, so I was really proud to be part of that, and um, we've, we've set a trend where they're doing that more and more. Um, and we all love the digital world, but there's no part of the industry uh, that an indie shouldn't touch. So we try to make sure that our successful projects actually get to physical retail as well, and we, we maximize every opportunity to expose of that content. So that was you know, probably the, the most exciting experience I've had. But fortunately, it's not a unique one. It's, it's something that we hope to be more the trend uh, than the exception. Uh, I like uh, you, you explained a little bit on uh, what you expect from uh, where a studio should be to go to you. If you can detail a little bit further, you mentioned that they can have like one successful game. You don't want like newcomers. It's not really the thing. Uh, can you detail a bit more for studios uh, such as mine that have developed work for higher stuff, not necessarily original IPs, or have developed original IPs but not so successful ones. Uh, how do you see this whole uh, thing? Well, um, I, again, I, I think you just have to be honest about uh, work, you know, working relationship that's going to make sense. Uh, I think on the developer side, there is more dollars out there than have ever been out there before. You've just got to pick your partner. I think for the investors, um, there's more projects out there than you can really afford uh, to support. And we've had over 600 submissions to our fund and we evaluated every one of them. So, you know, just speaking for our fund and for us, we'd ideally like a team that as that team has published a game uh, that has had commercial success, at least one. One of the other things we look for is what did they do uh, with that success? Did they all go out and lease Ferraris or did they uh, pour all the money back into the studio because they were thinking five years and 10 years down the road? And what do they want to accomplish as a studio? Do they want to get acquired? Um, you know, they want to retire in the next five years. Um, what is it uh, that they're, they're trying to accomplish and how are they uh, trying to get there? Um, and then, you know, we kind of share our investment strategy with them. And, and if there's uh, a cultural alignment and, and the same set of goals, we, we go ahead. But it's, it's relatively rare. Um, but I think it's rare by choice because it's got to be right. And, um, you know, these venture funds expect six projects to lose all their money and the seventh one to do a 20-fold return. We expect all our projects to be successful. And while I'd love, you know, a seven-fold return, we're just looking for a degree of success and we're looking for a long-term relationship. So, you know, you, you just got to align yourself with, with the, um, the investor themselves. And I think our investment strategy is, is unique to us. Maybe there are others out there like that, but it's a question of whether you fit with us and whether we fit with 
with you. Um, but you know, like I said, there's an, there's an endless supply of talented developers and investors. It's the matching part that's difficult. That's the first session of the day, so stay tuned for lots more. And everyone, please give a big round of applause to Jack Tretton. Thank you. Thanks very much, James.